Okay, good morning everyone. I, o <laughs> I always get the tough time slots, <laughs> the night after a good banquet, but that was fantastic last night. So I'm gonna let you sit back and relax a little bit and you're gonna think about, I'm, I'm giving you a lot of things today to think about. This is my favorite talk I give all year. I actually have already started clipping articles for themes for next year. But what I like to do is talk about, let's get to the slides here. Oh wait, we're gonna talk about accessing the Event Moby app. Okay, I'm gonna be Tom, <laughs> keep going. All right, we got that done. Log in if you need it. Here's our agenda. Yep. More, make your plans for the day. All right, now we're back to me. There we go. All right. This year we're talking about some, the business trends we're talking about here. Actually, I'm gonna move this. Let me get that. Sorry, Tom, can we take that out? Oh, right there. All right, this year we're gonna talk about how we use space, how we build space, how we reuse space, and how we move products between spaces. Because we've seen this mega trends of the demographics are changing and millennials are changing things we do. We're gonna look at a little bit as to why this is happening and how it's gonna affect real estate. We're actually gonna to touch on office, multifamily, retail, um, and industrial. They're out here. Now for me, a trend is basically a disruption that sticks. Like, I'm not gonna talk about something that I don't think is gonna be around for a while. So everything I'm talking about today is going to be around for a while. And you can trust me, because in 1999, I was talking to a bunch of real estate people and tried to convince them that email was not a fad. So um, they didn't believe me all then, but actually, one would argue now that email's going away. We were just showing business meetings being done by text, so it could be considered a fad if less than 15, 20 years. All right, so Millennial Report. Hopefully you all have read this. There's takeaways. It talks about what millennials are looking in the office. I'm not gonna go through this today, but we're gonna look at the effects they're having in other areas of our lives. Uh, the big takeaways from here, they want open. They want transparent. They want collaboration. They also want flexibility. There's lots of different things in here that we already do and we can already provide as a company. Um, but how is this affecting the rest of the world? Now, first of all, I want to step back and say, this is my latest and greatest business book I've read. This is at my top 10 list. So if you like uh, books like Made to Stick or The Tipping Point or Outliers, this is in that same vein. It's about how to be an original thinker and how to make that original thought stick. But I'm bringing this up now because this one sentence uh, really jumped out at me uh, as to why the millennials are causing us to rethink everything we do. The hallmark of originality is rejecting the default and exploring whether a better operation exists. Millennials are rejecting the default. And a lot of us here, we are the default. And why are they able to do this uh, that we haven't done it before? Why are they questioning everything? There's two, there's two reasons. Number one is technology. They see everything through a technology filter. Uh, everything that we've done before, they, there's gotta be an app for that, right? So they see everything through a technology filter. So that means stuff we were doing manually, they look at through technology. Second of all, societal shift. There's a shift in our society. Those of us who are Generation X or Baby Boomers or Silent Generation, we know somebody for whom the default worked, which means the old work default was 40 hours a week, 40 years, you get your gold watch, you get your pension, you go golfing in Florida. Now, we know people who that worked for. We know people who were protected by the unions. We know people who had pensions. We know people who got the gold watch. And by the way, the irony is everyone says the millennials were raised with everyone getting a trophy. For them, 40 years at one place and getting the gold watch, that's everybody gets a trophy for them. So it depends how you look at it. So for them, that doesn't work for them. I mean, we have fam um, we've grown up in families where there's a single breadwinner and even if that person was a CEO, and it usually was a man, he would still be home for dinner by 5.30. That doesn't happen in our world anymore. Uh, retiring at 65, many of the millennials will still be paying their student loans at that time. <laughs> so, so the idea of retiring at 65, and the boomers keep moving retirement age back and back, because what are we gonna do? I mean, we're living longer. So the default does not work. And this is why they're questioning things we've done. One of the busy, biggest examples that came out of the report was around the flexibility. Flexibility of hours, flexibility of work locations. Technology allows us to work anywhere. So why do we have to work at a certain place at a certain time? Uh, when I talk to some of these recruiters, we, we kind of laugh about how if you ever brought up flexibility 10 years ago or even five years ago, I would get labeled as not career-minded. 
oh, mommy track, definitely, that's a woman's thing, that's a, a parent's thing. But now, the young men were asking for flexibility more than anybody else. And you know who benefits from that? All of us, because now the biggest question around flexibility is commuting times. It does not make sense if you can work anywhere to sit for an hour and a half in Boston traffic when if you go an hour earlier or an hour later, it's 45 minutes. And there's many things like that. So people are asking for flexibility to work seven to three or, or 10 to seven or whatever the hours. They're not working less hours, they just wanna work differently. So I would challenge you to think of the millennials, what they're trying to bring into our world in the office as not a different work ethic, but a different work style and understand the reasons why. They aren't seeing that gold watch at the end of 40 years. They don't know where they're gonna be. They don't see companies that are gonna employ people for life. They don't know that. It's not natural to them. So this is why we're gonna talk about it's changing how we use real estate and who's using real estate and a lot of different things today. So first of all, here's a desk, a picture of a desk from 1984. Anybody else have that computer? Who knows what it is? <laughs> it's a Macintosh, yeah, it's an early, early version of the Mac. I think I had one of those. All right, and now I, I would raise your hand if you had a computer like that. Raise your hand if you had a computer like that. Okay, raise your hand if you had a Rolodex. Anybody in here not know what a Rolodex is? Nobody? Okay. <laughs> yeah, and how many of you are still using your Rolodex? There's the Apto people right outside the door. <laughs> you might want to go. All right, Solomon, I got one for you. All right, now everything, okay, this is a little much. I mean, I mean, I used to tote around. In my first law office, I had my encyclopedia, I had my uh, grammar style books, I had all those thesaurus, always, they traveled with me everywhere. I didn't travel with a globe, but that's a fax machine with bulletin boards. Now everything on this desk is in those two, those two screens. Everything that was on that desk could be done. Bulletin boards, um, I don't know the scissors, I guess you can cut articles. You don't have to cut articles out physically, you just clip them. Um, everything storage, everything is on those two things. Of course they don't have the messy wires everywhere that my desk has, but, but this raises the, the what? The shades, yeah, I know, you gotta have the shades. I don't know what, that, I don't know what that's about. This is actually a really neat uh, short little gif that uh, it actually shows everything disappearing. Um, if you could look it up and I, can, I have the link down there, the evolution of the desk. Uh, but here's the question, if you can now work from anywhere, what value does an office have? This is rejecting the default. We're not going, we used to go to the office because that was where our desk was, that's where our desktop was, that's where our storage was, those were the law books, uh, this was the library, this was everything we had in the office. But now, my office fits in my handbag, I can work on a plane. Sometimes I like working on JetBlue because they've got TV, movies, someone brings me coffee, it's, it's fantastic. Get the even more space legroom, not too bad. But rethinking the role of an office. This is actually a picture of a WeWork office. How many people have heard of WeWork? How many people have one in your city or area? All right, we gotta go. More of you will be raising your hands next year. Um, but this is a typical WeWork office. I can go to London, it would look like this. I can go to Israel, it would look like this. I can go to New York, it will look like this. I can go to our WeWork space in Boston. Yes, we are in a WeWork. It will look like that, except we have carpeting. Um, but really, they just give you a wood desk like that with a little lamp attached, and that's it. And we have four desks in the space of where my first law office was just me. And I'll tell you, I love my four desks in that office. We have another office next door and a glass space next door, and we have a couple more people in there. Um, I, love, I was lonely in my, little, my big office by myself when I was an attorney. Um, this is great. We all work in there. But this is what WeWork is doing. And they're not the only ones. There's other co-working space, but I know we work really well because we're in it. Uh, they're thinking about employee experience. If it's not about the desk, that's not where they're spending their money. They're actually providing areas for concentration, for collaboration, for socialization, education. And that's what they're thinking about for an office. It's not just where you store your stuff. It's less about the desk. Now looking at this office, it really literally is open, transparent, and collaborative. But how do you work in a space like that? Because we've all learned that full open offices don't work, glass cubes don't work, so they have a mix of everything. So if, if you join WeWork, you actually join as a member, even though they're technically subleasing you, and it's month to month. And you can get an open desk for $45, and you can go to any of the WeWorks around the world, and there's about 60 or 65, by the time I said this, it could be 70. Um, and you can have, they have phone booths if you have to take a private conversation. 
They have open space where you can collaborate and everyone comes. I never have to go to Starbucks to meet anyone for coffee because they all want to come to WeWork. Um, and if you come after certain hours, there's free beer. So you can have people for coffee or beer. Uh, there's a conference room space that you can rent. And I can be here and rent conference space um, in New York and meet, and meet clients there uh, just by having a $45 membership. Uh, the other things they have is an online member network. Of their 45,000 members, 70% have said they have done business with another WeWork member. Kind of like Sperry Vaness, right? <laughs> SVN, sorry. Where's the tip jar? <laughs> no, there's a dollar. It goes in the tip jar. Okay, I actually did it. Um, they have an online member network. We actually are working with some designers that are in a WeWork space. They have benefits and discounts, um, different things that are available. Uh, they have weekly events. Sometimes I feel they're daily events. Um, so it's very social. In fact, the founder of this has described it as it's basically an in-person social network. So why am I talking about WeWork? Well, somebody want to guess how many square feet they have in New York City? Throw out a number. How many square feet? What do we hear? 200,000. We work in the whole city of New York City. How much? 2,000. Getting closer. 3 million square feet in New York City last year. They are the biggest and fastest growing user of square feet in class A, in um, A markets right now. So they have 3 million square feet in New York. They highly have six locations. Boston, they're about to open a third location. Um, in the cities they're at, they're running at 98% occupancy for anyone open over six months. And here's another fact. 30% of their membership has more than 10 desks. So they're not just competing with other co-working spaces. They're competing with regular office space. They're another real estate user of space. Anyone know what the biggest uh, corporate real estate news was in the... Northeast in the past month or so. What corporate headquarters move? It's making the headlines. GE, yes, GE moving into Boston. Guess who took the whole first floor of our WeWork space? GE's energy startup company, Current. So they took the whole entire first floor of our WeWork building. So these are regular tenants. Um, we have radio tenants. We have like all sorts of different tenants and uh, share members. We're not tenants. So this is very interesting. So we have a real estate. Uh, user of space who doesn't own any space. They're leasing and then releasing all this space to everyone. So it's almost like Uber, which is the largest taxi service without a taxi cab. Airbnb is the one of those fastest growing hotels without a hotel. And WeWork is a real estate company without any real estate, owning any real estate. Uh, recently, their valuation, they just got another, they raised another billion in, ca in capital from Fidelity and T. Rowe Price Group. They, are value, they were valued based on that at $15 billion. To compare, Boston Properties is valued at $17 billion, and they own 10 times more space. And Mort Zuckerberg is apparently an investor in WeWork. So it's a different user of space. Now, what do they look for? So if they're coming to town, by the way, they are looking in B markets. They are looking in Nashville right now. They are looking in Dallas, Pasadena, Atlanta, um, Northern Virginia. So these are people you need to know. These are new buyers in the market, not nor new leasers, new la uh, lessors, I should say, in the, in the market. So when they look at a space, I talked to the, the head of the Boston uh, area, they look for mobility, density, and collaboration. They look for communities where that all comes together. And um, in Boston, where parking's a premium, and you're going to put one person per 100 square feet in your building, and that's how they do it. They look at the ratio. And so then they look at the building. Once they find the location, then they have to find the right building. And sometimes it's hard in Boston to re retrofit an old building because one person per 100 square feet, that affects your heating and cooling systems. That affects your parking. Uh, that affects a whole lot of things. Elevator, we have these dispatch elevators. Has anyone ridden in a dispatch elevator? It's a little disconcerting because there's a computer pad outside and you push the, button, the floor you want to go to and it tells you what elevator to go to and there's no other buttons in the elevator. And it's a little, if you change your mind halfway up, good luck, sorry. Uh, you don't, you're going where you're going. But that's how they can funnel more people up and down systems. So that's rejecting the default. We're changing the system. Um, so when they look at the, these different things, uh, in fact, in Boston, what's being appealing for buildings now, class B space, 
uh, if with brick and beam was going for more than lower level high rise in the market. So people want these high ceilings and workout space. So, so WeWork is another user in the market. So this is changing because this is the way the millennials want to work. But I tell you, the average age on my floor is closer to me or older. I mean, I'm not seeing these, it, that it's just millennials playing foosball. And by the way, these, the kids that are there work all the time. They love what they do. In fact, that is the WeWork t-shirt. Everyone says, we love what we do. They have t-shirts at WeWork that say that. And so this, this is a different work style, not a different work ethic. Everybody's working hard. And it's kind of weird, because people are saying, well, isn't it just kind of like Regis? It's kind of the opposite, though, because think about why people would go to a Regis. They wanted that mailing address in the, in the big city, and they didn't want even Regis on the door if you're meeting a client. You're trying to pretend that you've got this big office and you're meeting clients. Here, you can't pretend you're not in a WeWork. Like I said, we got, I'm surprised they don't make us wear t-shirts. I mean, it's, it's very clear where to WeWork. It really makes hiring easy. I get people like, we don't know what you do, but if you're hiring, we want to work there. So, I mean, people really want to be there. And they're affecting how people are looking at buildings. So how do you make an old building attractive? Try to find that neighborhood and community. They really do want to live near where they work. They need a restaurant. They need a retail. Uh, Boston had a little trouble expanding into the seaport until they got enough of the neighborhood and retail and people to live down there. Uh, you can make a suburban location urban by providing a cafe, by providing uh, things that people can get to. Uh, within a building, common areas. Full-on open space doesn't work. It's too loud, it's too distracting, um, but people want to be alone sometimes, but they also want areas to congregate. Lots of glass and interactive walls. I actually, um, Michael and I went over and met with the, the company that did the, if anyone saw Minority Report, when Tom Cruise goes and touches that window, that's real life technology that came out of MIT Labs. And we talked to the company doing that and they have different setups. So that's something that's coming. Collaborative spaces, it's conference rooms or it's, it's free space. Open space along windows. I mean, it's, it's the opposite. Instead of the private offices taking all the window spaces, it's letting everybody else come in. New buildings, if you have the opportunity to build a new building, build it in a neighborhood where there's a nearby community and the millennials will come. Uh, sustainability, in, one of the in the survey it came out, they care about shared value. They care about conscious capitalism. So if your building can be sustainable in some way, rooftop gardens, things like that, they really are interested in that. Bring the outdoors inside. This is just a trend that we're seeing as people are trying to bring more of the outdoors inside and have it flow. Easier to do in some parts of the country than others. I don't want to bring Minnesota inside in, my, um, in the winter. Um, enable natural light. Again, you see the design. People gather in the middle. Uh, lots of, again, glass, interactive walls. High ceilings. High ceilings. People like the space. They feel it's better. Uh, energizing the common areas. The old style, when you walk into some of these big high rides and they have these big, empty, cavernous hallways, fill every little corner with uh, just seating and collaborative space and run events. Uh, we have pop-up food vendors every morning. You walk in, oh, which, what's it going to be today? So it's the equivalent of the mobile trucks. All right, so that's a little bit on office space. Now, if you can work from anywhere, where do you want to live? Future of housing, we're looking at micro units. I've talked about these a couple of years ago. They are, and, and they're happening. They are happening. So this is probably a 225 square foot, even smaller unit. Uh, one of the things when you have a micro housing unit, every piece of furniture has to do, have more than one function. So it's changing furniture design. Futons and day beds are selling like hotcakes because they also are couches. If you notice these table, uh, the chairs for the little breakfast nook, they slide over and they're, they're little uh, table tray, they're side tables if you're sitting on the couch. That big screen, that's your computer screen, that's your uh, TV, that's everything. You don't need, we talked about before, you don't need a library of books if everything's on your Kindle. Remember those big stereos we used to fill up the back of your car when the speakers were this big? I mean, now everything's smaller. So these are micro units. Now, there is a problem with micro units and the fact that they're not permitted in many cities. Uh, in Boston, uh, we actually have some now, we have, uh, but we had a 450-foot minimum, and plus you had to have a certain amount of parking. We got around that by creating an innovation district in the seaport, and unfortunately, these are, are renting out like hotcakes, but they are $1,600. <laughs> 
$1,600. Yeah, <laughs> so, so they're not solving our affordable housing problem. problem. Um, so we need to um, rethink this, but it's, it's one of those hurdles we have to get through. Chicago, they're having some issues getting over this in different cities. So um, they are happening. Uh, we see them in other countries that have uh, space issues. Hong Kong, if you go over there, people are learning to live smaller, and it's going to be a trend. And people want to live alone but together. That's why Starbucks works. We like to be alone but together when we go, I do, I do my best work in Starbucks, you know, on airplanes. But it just, it's sort of, you know, the same idea. Um, some people will say it's just the kids still want to live in dorms. You know what? Uh, I mean, and people are staying single longer. They can't afford it. They don't want to live with their parents. So this is something that's going to stay, but we are going to have some government regulations to get over it. Next thing we're seeing happening is infill. These are areas that haven't been redeveloped yet or there, there's empty spaces. This is a, actually, this is a picture of a house that has been specifically designed to fit in a lot in uh, New Orleans, and it is trying to be affordable. It, it's trying to be affordable housing, by, so they're taking that smaller footprint, taking the micro housing, and they're trying to find lots that they can put this in within neighborhoods to re recreate a neighborhood. Um, what we have on here is the other picture. That is a uh, rack space. Um, those are basically mobile homes that are stacked in racks. And if you have this in Austin, and you want to move to San Francisco, you got to reserve your spot on the rack. And when it opens up, they just grab your container out, ship it right up, and you can put it in the rack in the other city. This is happening. This is rejecting the default. This is changing how we think about housing. We're also out there looking for, <laughs> you can take your park anyway. All right. OK, we like that one. OK. Uh, we're also looking for high opportunity neighborhoods. Again, this is that shared value. How can we help make a high opportunity neighborhood? There's groups like MREN. I, I had uh, got to present with the founder of that up at NIOP uh, in Toronto about conscious capitalism. And so MREN works with private investors to, to keep track of their portfolio, but they also are working with public uh, entities, uh, with governments, to identify lots of land that can be repurposed for different reasons. So if you go to the MREN site, MREN.com, and Opportunity Space does the same thing. I think they're based out of Boston. But if you, you can picture what Boston's like. You know, we have the Boston Redevelopment Authority. We have things on old yellowed sheets of paper, trying to get everything electronic and to discover what they have. In fact, MREN, I think, I believe, was working with Oakland, and they have found a lot of acreage that could be put together and redeveloped that the city didn't even know they had. So this is why people are trying to do the shared value. How can we help our cities develop housing? How can we work on affordable housing? How can we provide uh, young people with the places that they can live? Or how can we provide empty nesters a way to live in the city uh, and not have to pay these entirely high rents? Now, when you do infill development, a lot of time you're building a community. Can anyone tell me what is the best commercial uh, commercial piece of real estate or com commercial client to put into a community to rebuild it? I guess. School. Restaurants. There's a good reason why we want restaurants can help redevelop a community. Number one, millennials like to go out to eat. If you Cooking in that micro unit probably is not as much fun, <laughs> you know, but they like the experience of eating. They go out to eat a lot more. People are going out to eat, um, but they also employ the least employable parts of our population. They need busboys and girls. They need a lot of unskilled labor. They provide work at odd hours. People can have two, two jobs. It brings life to a community. Now, that's great, good, we'll go put in a restaurant. But in some of our municipalities, putting in a restaurant requires a liquor license. And this is, this is Ayanna Presley. For those of you in, in New England, you might want to remember her name. She's, uh, a, she was uh, the first African-American uh, woman to, actually, the woman to be elected to our city council. And her first task when she got on there was taking on the liquor licenses so that she could provide restaurants, create restaurants in areas of Boston where they were not provided. Now there's a problem with this. In Boston, the liquor licenses for the city of Boston are controlled by the Massachusetts state legislature people who don't have any interest in Boston because they have their own communities to care about. Also, the ones that are out there are owned by some pretty big national names. 
uh, restaurants. They've paid 400000 for them. They don't want anybody else just getting one. But you can't rebuild some of these areas in Boston without them. So she spent her time in the last five years working on this, and she has shaken loose a few uh, licenses for people. And she has also uh, is working now to introduce some legislation to take it out of the hands of the Massachusetts State Legislature and put it back in the city of Boston. And I feel we're really good about this because this is what the city council now looks like in Boston. And if you can picture us how we're displayed in the movies, usually it's a bunch of guys named Flaherty. Um, and this is a very different makeup. And they are looking at the permitting systems. They're rejecting the default. They come from the city. They want to represent the city. So I feel really good about what's going to happen in Boston in the next couple of years. Because the reason they can do this is the default never benefited them. And so they've gotten themselves in there. And actually, Michelle Wu, I think, is the youngest uh, person to ever be the president of the council. And she was elected unanimously. So that's what we're doing about community building. And this is part of the shared value that we want to think about. When we talked about that SVN shared value committee, I want you to come with me, come to me and Karen and Alex, and we want to get together and we want to talk about these ideas about how we can help this. We can help others and help ourselves. And this is one of the ways we're going to do it. Other housing changes. It's co-living. I mean, I used to call this roommates. But, but apparently, it's now organized roommates. And again, it's memberships in homes around the world. And these are a couple of the big names, Common, Crash, and Common Space. It's kind of like today's modern flop house. Uh, again, there's rules against this in Chicago. There's actually a lawsuit going on to try to change the rules to allow this because it violates uh, the laws. But what these do is they have shared, oh, before we get to that one, uh, it's shared living space where somebody, it's, it's a dorm. <laughs> I mean, what can I say? It's a dorm. But you can also move around between the different ones. Uh, and so if you can do that anywhere, these are car caravanserai. I just found this because these aren't in big cities. These are being anywhere in the world. It's basically like youth hostels with Wi-Fi and internet access. Uh, they're guaranteed to, why, if you can work anywhere, why not work from some stunning island off of New Guinea? Uh, so there's people looking at this around the world. Now, why am I talking about this one particularly to you? If you go onto the common space, uh, they tell you how to work with us. How do you add a property to the network? How do, you get, how do they buy a property? What do they look for? These are new users of real estate on the market. They're not tied down with some brokerage firm that already exists. Uh, and they are working at buying the property because one of them, Campus, K-A-M-P-U-S, went belly up because they actually um, only leased property and they couldn't quite make the subletting work on the living side of it. They didn't scale quick enough. And these are in cities. I think common space I showed is in Syracuse. This is not, these are not just in A markets. They're trying them in different markets, especially ones around universities. And of course, if you're going to talk co-living, the gorilla on the block, WeWork is not going to miss that opportunity. In New York last year, they launched We Live quietly, and they had their own co-living. Uh, now they're not so quiet because they're working with Vernado, and this is the first spot that they're developing in, in Crystal City uh, down there, and it's going to have 200 some units right next to their WeWork space there. And so they're going to combine. You can live and work and, and, in a, in, and in a community. They're creating their own neighborhood. That's basically what they're doing. Again, new users in the space. Okay. All right, so can anyone tell me what they think this building is? No, nope, not a jail. Not a mill. What? What I hear over there? A uh, club. It's a mall. It is actually the world's. Uh, it's actually the U.S.'s oldest continually operating mall, which means it's obviously on the East Coast. Anyone guess what city? Providence. Somebody knew it. <laughs> Somebody knew it. Yes, it's in Providence. That is not a crate and barrel. That's actually a micro unit. Um, and so this is a micro unit. You can actually live in a mall. There are retailers on the first floor. And then there's space. So if you have a mall sitting around, think about repurposing the mall. People are putting community colleges in malls. People are putting health centers in malls. Um, this is what's happening now. We're putting co-living spaces in malls. So if you've changed how we live and how we work, services change. Uh, this was very interesting. I like It's called Make Space. So Obviously, if you're downsizing, you probably, unless you're really good at that Komodo uh, organizing thing, um, you know, you're going to end up with a lot of stuff you're going to want to put in storage. 
So now that's a pain to go put it in storage. This company comes, takes photos, it's on an app, you can actually tell them, and they take it away and they put it in the storage and you can actually tell them by the photos, I want this back, and they bring it back to you. This is one of those many, we're calling them, the new term is DIFM, do it for me services. Uh, so there's tons of these. I mean, if you order Blue Apron, anyone get any of those meal plan where they send you the fresh vegetables? You like it? Love it. Okay, you're in Seattle, of course. You know, you do that. So, um, so, so yeah, there's all these services. People can come and, and wash your dog. Can do, I mean, they can do all sorts of things for you. In fact, I love this comment. Kara Swisher, she's a well-renowned uh, tech journalist. She once referred to San Francisco as assisted living for millennials. I mean, there's so much stuff that they can get done for them. <laughs> so, you know. But hey, th it works for empty nesters, too. I mean, I find myself using these services. Um, you know, it, it's different things. So, how are companies adapting to all these changes? IKEA, strong brand, thought leader. They are now, all their furniture, they're looking at having the ones with multiple uses. I mean, if I'm thinking about a micro unit, I'm probably going to go to IKEA to find furniture. I especially like that they're rolling out a recycling furniture program. So, when your furniture is getting old, tired, or you need to upgrade, you could bring it back to them, and they will either fix and resell it, or give you a discount off of new furniture. Smart business for them, smart business for our planet. So they're thinking about these things. They're 3D printing spare parts. So you know when you put it together and you're either, I usually have one extra screw on IKEA furniture, but sometimes you have one less. Uh, you can go and they will actually 3D print it in the store. They're trying to 3D print it in the store for you so you can just go and pick it up. You don't have to go and order it. Uh, flat packaging. You know, I was like, I didn't really think about it until it started being a thing. So I Googled flat packaging, and this came up from Korea. This is actually a doghouse that you can assemble, and they actually advertise, we'll ship it to you flat packing, packaging. It's safe. Flat packaging means you can put everything together, and it takes up less space, and it costs less to, to mail or ship, and you put it together yourself. And I really want this doghouse, but it's not big enough for my 90-pound dog. So, um, so yeah, but so it's, it's becoming a thing. So these are terms you're going to hear more of. And we can't talk about trends without talking about Amazon. And so last year when I stood up here and talked about drones, uh, yes, they are trying to deliver packages by drones. They have gotten the approval to test under 400 feet within eyesight of a pilot or on the ground. So that they are testing that now. There's so many hurdles to get over with the drones. But while they were doing that, they also filed a patent for mobile manufacturing hubs. These are 3D printers on trucks. So they don't have to store your extra parts they can print them while the truck drives to you. That's changing how we move things between spaces. We're going to talk about 3D printing now. <laughs> I tried to find a practical use for it. So I, you know, I can now 3D print my head and put it on a, a Lego's Star Wars action figure. I can finally be General Leia. Uh, um, so uh, yeah, so I live out my fantasies there. But so 3D printing. How many people understand how 3D printing works? Yeah, yeah, I, I see a few like, I think I do, in theory. All right, so here's how 3D printing works. For the Lego heads, if you want one, it's on Etsy, you can just Google it, 3D Lego heads and they'll come up. Um, I know what everybody's getting for Christmas next year in the office. Um, all right, so you take a picture of yourself and you put it into a computer and it creates a CAD drawing, computer-assisted drawing, just like we do with 3D architectural renderings. You, do a three, you create a 3D model of your head. And then when you, ship it, when you send it to a, a printer, a 3D printer, it divides it into thousands of layers, cuts it this way. And then it prints one layer, then it goes back and prints the other, the other, the other, and that's 3D printing. Now, as with all printers, the cost is not necessarily the printer. In fact, one of the biggest, most successful Kickstarter programs was for this $300 home 3D printer. Then they blew up Kickstart, and now the company went belly up because they couldn't handle the distribution of the printers. But 3D printers don't cost much. It's the materials that go into it. So you could have a 3D printer. Anybody in here have one? Yeah. All right, <laughs> there you go. So if you have any questions, you can ask him about the technical parts of it. But <laughs> right. You gotta go work on that Lego head, right? Okay, so, um, so that's how it works. But here's other things that you can 3D print. This is in China. They 3D printed a building. This is 
uh, they didn't print the whole thing, but they print, I mean, and then the whole thing is done by layers. Uh, what they did was they printed uh, the different sections and they just layered them up on top of each other. It's stronger. It's, they can put the wiring down in the middle. It cost about 40%, uh, 60% less in materials. Labor was only 30% of labor costs. The time was cut in half. So they're 3D printing and changing the way we build buildings. And here's a, a peek inside. See the layers? So they have a really oversized huge printer to do this. <laughs> but they're not printing the whole footprint at one time, but they're printing the different sections and stacking them up. Now, uh, the next picture, I'm just throwing in here because I was on construction and this is, I've seen so many articles about this in the past couple weeks. Uh, robots are now coming to help us build buildings. Uh, and so these are robots, they now have robots that can layer bricks. Uh, one of the positive uses of this is emergencies. Let's say Hurricane Sandy, if you needed to build a retaining wall, robots can work 24-7. But right now, they still need people to supervise. They can do basic things, but this is, it's one of these, this is coming. So next year, I'm looking at robots and artificial intelligence. So I'll be thinking about that a lot in the next year. All right, back a little bit to 3D printing. Once I got into the 3D printing world, I was like, this is fascinating. I mean, is this just like a, a one-off thing? What's happening? There's something called uh, 3dhubs.com. So if I have an idea for something and I want to design it, I want to design some new product, piece of jewelry, I don't know what it is, something that's probably made with plastic resin or, or, or something, um, I can somehow make a CAD drawing, a, a, a computer-assisted drawing, and ship it. I can find a, a, go to 3dhubs.com and find a local printer that will print with the materials I have, and they'll print it for me and ship it back. And there are 27,000 printers in their database. I think uh, the numbers on here say there's probably about 1,700 in the Boston area. And these are people who are commercial, will commercially print something that you want to invent. This is fantastic for doctors. I think if people watch Grey's Anatomy, you see they just 3D printed a rib cage the other day. I mean, this is for people who want to try new things and new inventors. This is empowerment. But it's also going to change how we build, manufacture, how we um, companies. Now we can be smaller businesses. Um, Etsy opened up their model to not just handcrafted, but small manufacturers. Uh, it means we don't have to ship things from overseas if we can 3D print them here. And so your challenge is, I would love to hear over the next couple of weeks, I mean, how is this going to affect your business? I mean, these are big changes that are not going away. Of course, back to Amazon. <laughs> so they're doing drones. They got 3D printing. Amazon Echo is their um, artificial intelligence unit where you can actually speak to it like Siri. Uh, well, it's not that useful now. Their idea is that you walk by and tell it, hey, uh, I think it's called Alexa. Mine's called Alexa. Uh, Alexa, I need more uh, supply. I need more laundry detergent. And it would then order it off Amazon and the truck would show up and it would be there. So that's the idea that what they're trying to work on. Uh, we've also heard in the news that they were putting in bookstores. And the number got really inflated that there was going to be 300 bookstores. Uh, there's not. They have a couple out there and they're testing the model. And the question is, are they really bookstores or are they going to be places to pick up your packages that you get delivered? Because we now buy everything from Amazon. It's so easy. Is it going to be a base where you can, are they going to 3D print things and put them there where you can pick them up? And I'd be really worried if I was UPS, FedEx, or the US Postal Service. Amazon is controlling distribution in new ways, which also means we might have a lot of those buildings coming back to the market, a lot of those spaces. So summing this all up, because that's a lot out there, uh, millennials are questioning the default option. And it is affecting everything we do. We have new users of space. They're using it different, differently. We're, um, creating new services every day for people who are in those spaces. But the good news for us is they want open, collaborative, and transparent. Those are words we were using before some of these people were born. Uh, so uh, they want it in their offices, they want it in their companies, they want it in their housing. And this is the neat part. It's very been a tip dar. OK, SVN. <laughs> we are open. We've always been open to sharing fees. Now we're open to full service real estate. We're open to entrepreneurs. We're open to diverse owners, employees, and clients. We've always been collaborative. And now we have an international platform. 
We collaborate with the entire real estate community. We represent our clients by mobilizing the entire community to work on their behalf. We've been crowdsourcing product class information across our whole network for ages. We're transparent. We share fees. We're transparent with our listings. They go on our site. We're transparent with local decision making. The owners are sitting in the communities that they're going to help rebuild here at SVN. So I just want to conclude by saying we are in the right place at the right time. We have a lot of new information. And I think it's all systems go. And I want to thank everybody for joining me this morning after such a great night last night. I hope it was worth your while to get up and have a little coffee with me. <laughs> thank you.